Good morning, Good morning everybody. Everyone. Good morning. This is Dale Goodine with the Division of Public Health. <clears throat> Hi. Hi, Dale. It's so good to have you with us today. Glad to be here. Thank you. As folks are coming in, would you please um, sign into the chat box and let us know uh, who you are, where you're from. And we have a prompt this morning we'd like you to also share your thoughts on. Um, what we're wondering today is what strategies are helping you to stay resilient and to continue your prevention efforts during the COVID pandemic. So if you'll share, we would be really grateful to see what your thoughts are on that. And I think we're gonna have a good crowd this morning. So thank, thank you everyone for taking time out of your week and out of your day to participate in the semi-annual SCOW meeting. We're excited to be able to connect with you all and chat. Um, we'll probably give a few more minutes for a few other folks to join. I see that uh, you folks are starting to put your ideas into the chat and I see that Carla Fleshman has indicated that she created a Zen garden in her backyard and hikes several times a week to stave off the COVID isolation. That sounds really fun, much more ambitious than me, but uh, I think that's great. Good morning, Elizabeth. Hi, Dana. Hi, Megan. Good morning, this is Lisa Lynch. Good morning, Lisa. Good to have Hi, you with us. Good to be here. Good morning, Dr. Rapp, MJ. Good to see you guys. Thank you. Hi, Mayur. Hi, Jim. Hey, Sharon. Hey, everyone. Hi, Jim. Good Folks morning. are really, we are, as Laura said, expecting a pretty large group today. So we're probably not able to keep up with everybody as they're entering the room, but we're still welcoming you all. Sign in, please, and let us know what your thoughts are about staying resilient during the past, gosh, how many months has it been now, folks? Five? Hi. Four months? Hi, Isabella. Hi, Dr. Wang. Thanks for joining. Dana's also a gardener. So since we still have folks joining, we're going to give it another couple of minutes. Hi, Cindy. Karen, that sounds good. Karen's cooking her way through the pandemic. Have you made anything that you find that you really love so far? Oh, Cheryl's crocheting, watching movies. That's what I'm doing, watching movies. I'm reading. I'm very excited to be reading. A lot of hiking. Great. Oh, Zoom game nights. I have never tried that. Sounds like fun. Uh, one thing we want to mention is that folks, um, we, we uh, turned video off and we turned microphones on to mute, but we would really welcome everybody to turn their cameras on. Um, you know, join in with your, you know, un unmute yourself to join into the conversation. Uh, we look for a, a really interactive group today. Um, we do have a lot going on with our agenda and we're pretty excited about it. So uh, we're hoping for high energy in the, in the Zoom room today. Okay. 
Laura, um, do you think we should start at this point or give it another minute? Let's go ahead and get started. Okay. All right, so somebody's going to have to remind me if I'm talking when I've muted myself. I do that at least once a meeting, so I'm pretty sure it'll happen today. But good morning, everybody. Um, this is Sharon Merriman Nye with the SEOW here at Center for Drug and Health Studies at the University of Delaware. Um, we want to welcome everyone today uh, to our summer meeting. Although we're sad that it's not an in-person meeting at Buena Vista, we're still happy to be able to connect with so many of you, and we're really um, delighted by the very robust turnout. We have a lot of folks joining today um, from lots of different um, spaces and places throughout the state. And um, I think we're also, our team is also very excited today because, you know, we are so invested in our prevention work, but quite honestly, most of the time we're looking at problem issues and that sort of thing. But today, we're really excited because we have a very positive um, focus. We're looking at we're looking at protective factors. We're looking at resiliency. We're looking at positive childhood experiences, and so we're turning our faces to the sun. We have great we have great uh, speakers planned for this morning to talk about these things, and we are um, we're anxious to get started. So. There's so many folks, we're not going to be able to do a whole, a whole round of introductions of everyone, but I did just want to briefly introduce the SEOW facilitator team here at the center. Um, of course, you know uh, Dr. Laura Rapp, who's the PI on the project, um, and MJ Scales, who is also leading the um, facilitation efforts here at the center. Both of those folks will be presenting uh, a little bit more on today's agenda. We have um, Dr. Rochelle Brittingham and Jim Heiberger, who are leading the survey uh, efforts here at the center, and they'll be uh, presenting a little bit later on what the status of the surveys are at this time. Um, also working with them is Sophia Gonzalez and Angie Brown. Um, we have a number of other folks on the team, Dr. Dana Holtz, uh, Mr. David Borton, Ms. Eileen Sparling, uh, Dr. Cheryl Ackerman, Daryl Chambers, Mr. Daryl Chambers. Um, and a cadre of wonderful graduate research assistants. Uh, we have Rachel Riding, who's done a great deal of work in recent years on the annual EPI report, which will be coming out in early fall. Um, we have Wenjin Wang, Rachel Schilling, Brandy Pugh, Bill Gratton, and Isla Priato. Um, and we're happy today to have with us um, Dr. Christy Vischer, who is the director of the center. And um, I think Steve Martin will be joining us in a little while as well, and everybody knows Steve. Um, so if I've missed anyone on our team, apologies. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to keep up with who's in the room. It's been pretty challenging with so many folks, but I also wanna say that we have a lot of new members joining us today um, in the network. And although we don't have time for everyone, to introduce themselves throughout the room. We do want to ask that anyone who's new to the SEOW might want to take the moment to unmic themselves and introduce themselves, let us know where you're from and what your particular connection to the data might be. So I will just ask anyone who would like to, to share that. Hi, my name is Dana Belfiore, and I'm with the Domestic Violence Coordinating Council. And I'm sorry my video is not working right now. Um, but my connection and the DVCC's connection to um, data is really to kind of um, help us develop right now our uh, resource manual, domestic violence resource manual for healthcare professionals. Um, and also just have a better sense of what's going on locally um, so we can include those numbers in our reports on a regular basis. Thank you, Dana. It's great to have you. Good Hi, morning. Everybody. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay, I'll go. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Cindy McDaniel. And I am, I run the school offense diversion program at the Delaware Center for Justice. 
And that means that kids who are charged, who are arrested as a result of their school discipline experience and start working their, their way through the court system, most likely are referred to our program. I am here um, as a result of meeting with Sharon. Thank you, Sharon. And our conversation was focused on the data that I do collect, um, which I um, really don't know what to do with, other than I have this desire to share it with DOE so that we are aligned in how we discipline our kids. And I've also been, I'm grateful to Jim Heiberger, who has also joined me in this work to collect um, better data. So I'm really glad to be here. I'm Welcome, Cindy. Thank you. Other newcomers. Good morning. My name is Dale Goodine. Uh, I recently transitioned into a role with the uh, Division of Public Health. Uh, it was a position uh, uh, that was re vacated by Fred Brookman. Uh, I oversee the administration of the Burfus, uh and the YRBS and a couple of the other surveys uh, that are conducted by the Division of Public Health. So um, my interest in the data is getting the data uh, so that it can be utilized uh, by everyone here within this group and a lot of the partners within this uh, forum. Thank you, Dylan. We do use the data a lot from those sources. Um, they, they are heavily featured in the EPI report that's coming up and a lot of the data products that we've created over the years. Yep. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank, thank you. I can go next. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Claire Wong. Um, I am the new Associate Deputy Director at DSAM. Um, I oversee the Bureau of Research Evaluation and Population Health, working very closely with Laura and her team. Um, and this is my second week um, on this job, um, and I think third week living in Delaware. Um, I came to um, DSAM um, I'm a physician epidemiologist. I came to DSAM um, from being the VP of Research at New York Academy of Medicine, uh, as well as being on faculty at Columbia School of Public Health. Um, very much looking forward to be part of this group. We are very much looking forward to having you. Thank you. Hi, good morning. My name is Megan Pell. I'm from the Delaware Positive Behavior Support Project, and I'm really excited to be here. And welcome to Delaware, Claire. Really glad to have you. And um, we're just really excited to have the opportunity to work with schools throughout the state and um, help them to make a database decision making that's um, really meaningful to their students and their families and their staff. So thank you for welcoming us today. Thank you. Anyone else new to the group? Maybe this is your first meeting, but you've been on the network for a while. Yeah, hi, this is Karen McLaughlin from the Division of Public Health, and that kind of sums me up. I um, am not new. I've been uh, working with you guys for quite a while. We're in going into the third year, I guess, of a project of looking at data for the um, prevention of rape and sexual assault in Delaware. But this is my first meeting. And um, so I guess I, I figured I probably should introduce myself. Um, I think I know a lot of you already. I'm really glad to see that um, Fred Brueckelman's position has, has been replaced and we welcome you. Um, I hope to work with all of you a lot more. We, are, we launched a, a project to look at indicators to try and figure out um, how we can better evaluate using data, better evaluate the violence in Delaware and how we can look at that and, and figure out how we can um, address the protective factors and risk factors in a more collaborative way and we're trying to get more groups to work together using that data. So I'm really, really glad to be, finally be able to come to a meeting and looking forward to hear all you have to say. We are delighted that you are here today, um, Karen, um, and 
as a reminder, for those of you who were at Buena Vista or able to join by Zoom back in, I think it was in January when we last met, we did present um, a, a data uh, grid um, that we were using to frame out that evaluation process. So you might remember that. That was Karen's initiative. So we're happy to have you. Hi, my name is uh, Tim Gibbs with the Delaware Academy of Medicine and the Delaware Public Health Association. And Claire, welcome to Hot Humid Delaware. We hope you all enjoy it. And uh, David, welcome to the footsteps of uh, Fred Brookleman. And Karen, how are you doing? Um, so uh, among other things, we're the publisher of the Delaware Journal of Public Health. The first of the two-part issue on current research is just posted at djph.org. And among other things, it has a, uh, has a couple of articles uh, from this group uh, in it. And uh, it's a two-part. It is a beast of uh, a journal. I think there are 45 total articles. And I thank you all for all the contributions you make in Delaware. Thank you, Tim. Um, yeah, the SCOW is very happy uh, to have collaborated with our friends over at DSAM, at KIDS, and at Public Health, and with a number of folks over in DOE to put together uh, a research article on vaping in Delaware. So I think we're published in part two of the journal. That's Cor the issue Correct, that's which will out. come out probably in uh, seven to 10 days. So, so part one's pretty much pure COVID, and it's remarkable and gratifying to see how much is being done right here in our own little state. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, my name Hi. is Carla Fleshman. I'm with Transitions Delaware. It's a private practice with a high concentration in LGBTQ youth and adults, which leads me to the Delaware Youth Risk Behavioral Survey, which I often reference when I'm doing culturally responsible trainings on creating safer, more supportive schools. Thank you for inviting me to this group. I appreciate it. Welcome. I'm glad that you are here. Uh, we've talked many times over the years and it's nice to be able to have you in the room. That's great. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's so nice to see so many familiar names and faces. I'm Isabella Weber uh, with Planned Parenthood of Delaware. And so, um, in addition to providing uh, sex ed across the state of Delaware, we also provide a wide range of professional training. Um, and we have a really robust program for um, folks with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. And so we're always looking for good data around sexual health, um, especially data that's disaggregated by how someone identifies their sexual orientation, their gender identity, and also um, whether someone identifies as a person with a disability. So appreciate being invited to this call. Thank you and glad to be here. Thank you, Isabella. It's good to have you. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, we have been focusing on in recent years is shared risk. Um, shared protective factors, and we know that um, there's a great deal of overlap among these different spheres of work. Um, so that's an area that we have a great deal of interest in, and, and we're going to be pursuing doing some data product around in the future, so this is very timely. Thank you. Anyone else would like to introduce themselves at this point? Good morning, I'm Lisa Lynch. I am with the Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health, overseeing the uh, program management of the uh, Substance Abuse Prevention Treatment Block Grants and the Community Mental Health Block Grants. And I work very closely with Dr. Rapp and her team um, to gather the data for our annual report. And um, I'm happy to be here to learn more about it. Thank you. Thank you. We are so happy to have you. This is great. Okay. Anyone else? Well, we're so happy to have the new folks. We're so happy to have the returning folks. And we're delighted to have people that are able to make it to a meeting that have been wanting to get to a meeting. So this is, this is really wonderful. Um, I am going to just remind folks that we are recording today. Um, we will also send out the slides and post the presentations on our website um, after we 
you know, wrap. We'll, we'll follow up with some of these materials as well. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Laura Rapp, who, as I said, is PI of the SEOW project, works very closely uh, with our partners over at DSAM on many evaluation projects, um, also works with a number of other agencies, including the kids department. And she's going to talk a little bit today about the four goals of the SEOW. I kind of got out of sequence before I did that. I just wanted to do a quick flash of the agenda. After Laura, we're gonna have our survey folks and Dr. Brittingham talk a little bit about what's happening with the youth surveys that are conducted in Delaware. Um, we'll have some questions and answers around that. Then we're gonna have a little breakout to have the participants in the room talk about what might have changed in terms of your data needs and your collection strategies due to COVID. Um, once we come back, we'll report out any themes that we've emerged. Then I'm going to turn it back over to Laura, who's going to present data on the well-being index in Delaware. And um, I believe Dana Carr is going to also um, provide a few comments from DSAM. We'll move into MJ's presentation on positive childhood experiences. And then we're going to have our featured speaker, who is Terry Lawler from the Department of Education in Delaware. And Terry's going to talk about positive childhood experiences and protective factors as well. We'll have some group discussion around action steps that we as members can take within our respective worlds to promote positive childhood experiences, protective factors, and resilience. Then we'll wrap with some member updates. And finally, I will remind folks that we are conducting um, a satisfaction survey for the SEOW because we're always seeking to improve what we're doing and to be able to rely upon your feedback as to what it is that we can do to help you with your prevention work. So we'll give a pitch for that and share the link and then we will adjourn for the day. So. Without any further ado, now I will turn it over to Laura Rapp to talk about the goals of the SEOW. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you. Um, all right, so we are very excited for today's meeting and presentation. I wanted to give a little bit of background and sort of grounding as to what an SEOW is. Um, we are the Delaware State Epidemiological Outcomes Work Group, and you guys are all members of it. The SEOW is actually a funding stream from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration um, that is part of the Strategic Prevention Framework. It was originally started as previous iterations of the SPIF and has been going on in Delaware now for over 10 years, which is very exciting. Um, it makes me kind of happy to think that this group has transitioned over the past decade or so um, to continue to hopefully meet the needs of the community, uh, state agencies, organizations as they make their data-driven decision-making. So SAMHSA has identified four goals of an SEOW. The first is to identify, analyze, and share data. Um, we are doing that today. We all kind of do that on an ongoing basis. And it's one of the things that we really enjoy about the SEOW is uh, identifying data sources and getting them out to into the hands of the people who need it. We usually look at over 20 data sources a year and you all, a lot of times bring to attention more data sources that we can then incorporate into products as well. So thank you for doing that. The second goal is to create data guided products. Um, we do this and part of that satisfaction survey that Sharon mentioned is to see what sort of data products people are using and what you guys would like to see more of as you're out in the communities um, doing a lot of the prevention work around substance use and related risk behaviors. The third goal is to train communities in understanding and using data, which is something we do proactively, but also try to respond to requests as well. We recently, um, MJ led a training in partnership with one of our featured speakers, Terry Lawler. Do you see how that give and take goes? <laughs> we kind of do a training, she comes and presents. It's a nice relationship. Um, so we go out and do trainings in the communities. The one that just happened about two weeks ago was on data-driven decision-making. And that was one that MJ led with the team. And then the fourth and final goal is to build state and local level monitoring systems. And this meeting here is an aspect of that. Pushing out information through the listserv is another. And we're always seeking to build a more robust monitoring system. So if there are other individuals that 
you think would benefit from being part of the SEOW and the SEOW would benefit from them having be engaged in it, please send that information along and make that connection because we're always looking for new individuals to bring to the group. So next up is actually going to be my colleagues. Uh, Dr. Rochelle Bradyham is going to lead the discussion um, between her and Jim Heiberger on the school surveys, the YRBS and the Delaware School Survey, and the impact of COVID on this most recent implementation of the survey. So I'm going to kick it over to Rochelle. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, this will be rather brief and a bit of a high level overview. I apologize that this discussion is going to be a bit of a downer compared to some of the other really good presentations that are going to be coming um, as we highlight some of the positive things that come out of some of the surveys. Um, next slide, please. So we were in the field this past school year, so 2019-2020, um, and we had three surveys out. It was the Youth Tobacco Survey, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, the middle school one, as well as the Delaware School Surveys. Um, because of the way sampling went, we ended up being out in the fall trying to collect data for the Youth Risk Behavior Surveys. And while we did that, we were also surveying students using the DSS, especially in the eighth grade, since it was a middle school survey. So at the end of our administration period, which ended up obviously being disrupted because of COVID, we walked away with a fairly representative sample of eighth graders. Um, so our total end there was almost 3,800 students who had completed the survey. In terms of county breakdown and racial breakdown, um, we were looking at, as I said, a representative sample from the entire state. Um, and in terms of school participation, it was, it was quite good. Uh, we had 56 schools. We asked to participate. 27 of them said, yeah, we would do it. We had a couple of more schools lined up for us to come in and administer the surveys. Uh, but unfortunately, we had to we either proactively reached out to them or they wound up coming to us to say, you know, we need to cancel, like school is going to go on online, um, you know, starting Monday and things like that. In terms of the DSS fifth grade and the 11th grade, uh, as one can imagine, um, because of the administration time and the disruption there, with the fifth grade, we collected starting in December, um, it was towards the latter half of the month, we were going into some of the elementary schools, surveying students. We started, we continued doing that in January and February, um, but again, disruption. And then with the 11th grade, trying to get into some of the high schools, we were encountering some of the same challenges that we've seen in previous years um, based on scheduling and then the couple of schools that we did have on the docket we ended up having to cancel those. Um, one of the things we recognized worked really well was starting with the fall administration with the DSS. So we're going to continue doing that moving forward and I'll touch on that a little bit more in just a moment. Um, next slide, please. So for this upcoming year, the two surveys we're gonna have out in the field are the Delaware School Survey, uh, fifth, eighth and 11th grades, and then the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, so the YRBS, the high school, but that doesn't start until next spring. Um, we're, we're very cognizant of the unusual timing uh, of some of these surveys relative to what's going on in schools. Uh, next slide, please. And so we have some administration considerations that we're dealing with, and we wanted to make sure you all knew what was, uh, what was going on. Certain schools are looking into in-person models. We have on, like fully online models, and then we have these hybrid, maybe some students would go into the classroom, some students would do it virtually. And so we're thinking through a lot of these different uh, administration styles or things that we might have to do to be able to get some of the data that we need that we report out on but to do it as safely as possible we do not want to create risks risky situations for our staff for the students 
for the teachers. Um, so safety is really key with all of that. One of the things that we're looking at, regardless of which method we have to use, whether we're going in in person and dealing with um, new visitor policies, making sure everybody has appropriate PPE, or doing it fully online that we've never done before in Delaware, um, we do want to make sure that we're mindful of school's instructional time. There's been a lot of concern about how much school kids missed since school shut down in the middle of March. Uh, and while everything went up online, different schools had different levels of success engaging students based on uh, things very often outside of their control in terms of internet access, computer access, things of that nature. So we're working through like lit reviews, we're having discussions with other senior staff members, you know, trying to make sure that whatever we do, we do it with fidelity because going and going fully online, going partially online. We just have not done that before. And we recognize that some of the data we gather from that may not look like the data and the trends that we've obtained in previous years. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. I mean, we've been talking with people out in the community as well. Uh, honestly, here's a, here's a plug, but if anybody knows anybody in administration, you know, we're not asking to go into the schools right now, but if they would like to have a conversation with us about where they think some of the stick points are and some of the challenges happen to be, please reach out to Jim or I, we would love to talk to them. Um, there are, you know, concerns with schools that are doing it in two in the hybrid models where students and parents can opt out in terms of being face to face, you know, what are we going to do if half the class is sitting in the class and half the class is sitting online? Um, so this is, this is an administration unlike anything we've seen before. Uh, and we're trying to plan for all possible scenarios, recognizing that, you know, there are going to be bumps along the way. We're trying to collect data for everybody. Uh, but I think this will be a good segue into the, the breakout session. Um, but if you have any questions, comments, concerns, feel free to reach out to Jim and I. We're happy to talk through some of it with you. So I'm going to turn it back over uh, to Sharon now. Thank you, Rochelle. And, and thank you, and Jim, and uh, Sophia and Angie for doing all of the legwork on getting out into the field, but also to really be sensitive to the current circumstances and what's happening and what the needs are of the folks that are actually, you know, on the, you know, on that school end of the uh, data collection for this. Um, I think we should now go into our breakout sessions. MJ uh, is, has sorted folks into a breakout uh, room where you'll be in small groups. And um, the question that we're asking now, and this really does uh, dovetail with what Rochelle just talked about, is how have your data needs and collection strategies changed due to COVID-19? So I think we're gonna be in our breakouts for about six minutes or so. And then um, if, if folks in the room wanna report out like what the basic theme or takeaway from your group discussion is, we'd like to share that when we come back into the large group session. Okay? So MJ, you wanna go ahead and, and sort us out? Yes, absolutely, Sharon. I will say that if you did not log in with your um, email address that you registered with, it will take me a, a minute or two to get you um, in the right room. So uh, I'll sort everybody over, but like I said, if you didn't, um, if you used a different email address to log in, uh, I will need to manually move you over. So just one moment, okay. please. Okay. Thank you.
<laughs> so I, I think we're all back in the main Zoom room now. Um, would that be correct, MJ? Yes, ma'am, I believe so. Everyone should have made it back from the land of breakouts. <laughs> That's good. It's There's always nice. one straggler on the field trip, so we don't know, <laughs> but everyone should be back. So how many, how many rooms did we have? Um, four? We actually had six, because we had about 50 okay. people. Okay. So um, I would like to just open it up and invite um, folks from their different rooms to just somebody take a... Uh, you know, take a lead and just kind of report out anything that was particularly noteworthy that your group talked about. Anybody? I guess uh, since I was part of group one, I will, uh, I'll go here. Um, so the biggest issue that seems to be uh, out there is data collection issues. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously it's hard to get real time data and um, so everyone's kind of had to adapt. That, that seems to be the key, um, you know, which is fairly obvious. Right. Um, you know, uh, obviously the same issues that everyone has, you'll have a large number of requests of data that you need and you're gonna have to kind of weave it together and piece it together as best we can. Um, and then obviously some of the issues with, um, you know, mental health and substance use clients uh, trying to reach out to them, uh, get authorization to switch to telehealth, you know, all the privacy issues and the, the contact issues. Um, so, uh, you know, everything, the key is to be adaptive and be creative. Um, and that's, that's kind of what we talked about. Well, thank you for reporting out. I will just say that, that a number of those themes came up in our discussion as well. On top of the things you mentioned, um, you know, uh, Karen McLaughlin mentioned, you know, the hierarchy of needs have shifted. And so priorities are not, you know, necessarily aligned with um, our ability to collect data or even to provide services because things have been turned around. So we have, you know, the challenge of providing services, let alone providing you know, collecting data on what's happening and what the needs are. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, Bill Lynch also mentioned they're seeing tremendous amounts of collateral damage relative to COVID, like lots of enhanced needs in terms of mental health, in terms of substance use and things of that nature. So, so that's what we kind of had rolled to the front in our group. Um, and a number of projects are being impacted. It's not just data collection efforts in the schools, but in the public health clinics, in other settings as well. Uh, but uh, what, are, what are some other things that other folks touched upon in their respective groups? So I can talk for group two. I got a little chat nomination to, to report out for the group. So um, there were a couple of things that came up. Some of the same themes for group one. Um, an, Another area is um, the impact of telehealth has really helped us sort of shift to deliver service, but it's also made it more difficult for some follow-up um, in times with the kind of data um, Amy talked about with DSAM, the kind of data that they're trying to collect, you know, may have been done by peer specialists um, in the, the clinic setting, and that sort of is just very difficult to accomplish now if, you, you don't have folks actually in the clinics. Um, another point that came up is um, with the school surveys, you know, Liz talked about the youth tobacco survey and, you know, the recognizing the challenge of uh, not being in schools and how do we address that and that there were some pilots, uh, Liz and I worked, she, she reminded me, we worked a while back on doing a pilot uh, an online pilot at the School for the Deaf that took the youth tobacco survey and translated into, um, you know, a Qualtrics survey to gather that information from students. So looking back to pilots and other um, areas where we may be able to adapt, um, you know, collection tools is something that I think is a focus that um, just is really timely now. 
And another issue that came up uh, that Tim, Tim raised about uh, COVID testing is that just the rapid ramp up of this testing effort has really you know, put some challenges in terms of the quality of the testing and the um, administration of testing and just being able to track that and uh, monitor that quality is just really challenging in these times. So thinking about how to best do that um, you know, efficiently and um, correctly is something that is a focus right now. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have anything that they want to add that maybe was touched upon that we didn't, uh, we haven't covered yet before we move into the next uh, segment? Yeah, so um, oh. I was in group six and with uh, Shelly, I forget your last name, I'm so sorry, but she pointed out to us that follow-ups are becoming difficult. Um, and getting to the students and getting to people who receive services for follow um, follow up measures and baseline measures, and I wanted everyone to know it kind of shines a light on a known problem with school surveys or other type of surveying instruments, is that oftentimes the people you want to get the answers from or who need most services are going to be the hardest to get a hold of, and with schools now going. Um, school scheduling being up in the air with COVID and potential closures. It's just that we may see the data only, the surveys only hit students that are mo more likely to conduct a survey opposed to the students that are gonna be hardest to reach and maybe those who we wanna hear back from the, from the most. So just keeping that in mind when the data comes around next year, that you know, there may be a change in the sample of those who actually completed it and how we all are addressing that. Thank I'll you. Say that something, Megan, something Megan touched on in our group was um, just kind of a level of coordination and talking about what's happening at the national level, especially on projects that you know are maybe happening across state and some of the I know that wasn't the main point, Megan, but I think that was one of the things that I haven't heard the group report out on is just kind of that extra level of coordination that this is taking on some of the larger data collection efforts. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, so many, so many layers to the challenges, you know. Anything else that we haven't touched on yet? Well, as you know, <clears throat> as we always like to say, um, these are questions that we're going to be pondering for a while. And you may have thoughts after the meeting that you'd like to share. So please feel free to reach out to us and, and uh, let us know your thoughts, either in terms of something you're observing or in something that you think could be very helpful. I did want to mention one thing that Bill Lynch also shared that I thought was really helpful. And that is that um, he works out of a collective in New Jersey that um, became, you know, like that, that, that came together every week because as you know, New Jersey was hit very hard and they produced a resource guide that had national, state and county and local uh, resources available. You know, he made the point that you can flip that around and look to those groups, particularly local groups as, you know, stakeholders in this effort and possibly folks to be able to engage in modifying and adapting data collection efforts so that we can still meet those needs as best as possible. So I think that was a really good recommendation. And now I'm going to turn it over to Laura, who is going to present on the well-being index, highlighting some of Delaware's eighth grade data from, um, from the school survey. And uh, mm -hmm. I, for one, am very interested in seeing the, the data on this. So thank you, Laura. I like your surprise because you have seen this, but I appreciate the setup anyway, Sharon. Um, yep. I, so I don't welcome. think I saw all of it. You haven't seen it? All right, I, think well, then, I think there's new stuff in here from what I saw. So, okay, great. Great. Um, so my colleague, Dana Carr over at DCM is also part of this presentation. Um, she is very well versed and invested in prevention efforts in the state of Delaware and is also here to kind of add her context and also answer questions. Um, but we wanted to provide a little bit of information around the well-being index. And I appreciate 
um, Rochelle and Jim for kind of setting up some of this information that we're gonna talk about. Excuse me. So some of this may be a little bit redundant based on uh, the information that Rochelle just provided about um, how the survey rolled out for this past year. I did want to call out that there was a 90% response rate for this well-being index that I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Um, and like Rochelle and Jim had mentioned, um, the fifth and 11th grade administration were halted for this year. So typically when we do some presentations around the youth survey data, we may look at eighth grade and 11th grade or fifth, eighth and 11th, depending on what the focus is and what the question is that we're trying to answer. Um, but in this case, uh, we focused in on eighth grade because that is where we had the data. Um, so the question was included in the other surveys and we're hoping that for future rounds of implementation we'll have, we'll have that data. And I also wanted to thank Rachel Schilling, who's on the call, who, uh, and Jim Heiberger, of course, uh, Rachel Schilling is one of our wonderful graduate students who ran the analysis on that, on this, and um, in conversations with Jim and um, Rochelle, they really casted a wide net because this was the first time we included the well-being index in the school survey. Uh, so we wanted to look at it across a number of different variables in the school survey data set. And then we really refined that down to what are some of the more salient points that we wanted to present. I will say that this is the first time we're really presenting on it. This was the first year that this was included. Um, and these are still early analyses. So I want to kind of put my disclaimer that these are tentative at this point. Um, now, for those of you who are not um, familiar with the well-being index, uh, well-being is, is, there's a lot of measures around well-being. This one is centered around Cantrell's ladder, and you can see an image of it on the right of the screen. It's an actual physical ladder that has 10 rungs numbering, um, or has 10 rungs on it from zero to 10, and then it has the best possible, sorry, I'm not sure why it went forward. It has uh, best possible at the top and worst possible at the bottom. And it's two simple questions. There's versions for adult and versions for youth. Um, and it's asking where an individual places their life right now. So that's the present question. And then where does someone think their life will be in five years? So that is the future question. This is a validated measure that is done in many countries um, throughout the world. And it's also included in a number of ongoing surveys in the United States, including um, the Gallup that you're going to see a little bit of data on as well. So DCAM is particularly interested and they came in and requested and asked if we could include this on the survey. Um, like I said, their, from their focus, the, the emphasis is on understand well-being and equity in different population segments. And this presentation is going to speak to some of that. We do look at a lot of data and a lot of disparities around data and a lot of specific subpopulations um, to see how different groups and different individuals um, experience life and engage in life. And this well-being index is now another layer that we can add to that. Because instead of looking and reporting on specific behaviors that a youth is doing, this is actually asking the individual about their life and their opinions on their life right now. And that is correlated and connected with a lot of other outcomes that we do expect to see, like increased substance use um, or maybe increases in mental health concerns, suicidality. But this is, this to me, some of its focus and some of what makes it strong is it's, it, it's the individual's opinion on where their life stands right now versus us attributing certain behaviors um, like suicidality to it. So it gives that individual kind of the control to tell us um, through the survey form where their life is now and where they see their life going. So the second point that DCM is, is particularly interested in for the Delaware School Survey is monitoring the well-being of youth over time. Uh, this was going to be our baseline data, and it will be our baseline data for eighth grade. We're hoping the next implementation will have some baseline data for fifth and 11th. Um, it's also kind of timely, too, because this was taken right before COVID for the eighth graders. So it'll be, it'll probably just be something we're going to want to keep our eye on for future implementation to see if there's to see how that pans out, to see how the trends are over time. 
So uh, just a little note um, to help ground some of the data that we're going to be presenting on. I mentioned that there's the present, where do you feel you are now, and then there's the future, where do you feel your life is in five years. And this is really broken up into three major categories, thriving, struggling, and suffering. So you're going to see that in a number of the slides. The other way we're going to present the data is the mean across all those rungs. Um, for the present, um, that is if an individual um, if they said they were thriving, that's where an individual uh, labeled themselves anywhere between seven to 10, struggling five to six, and suffering is four and below. There is a little bit of variation for future among the thriving and the struggling. The thriving is a little bit smaller, eight to 10, where the struggling is a little bit of a larger category of five to seven. So how does this break down in our data? How does this break down for our eighth graders in the state of Delaware? Well, 67% believe that their life currently is thriving. 20% said suffering or said struggling and 14% of Delaware youth said suffering. We also did ask that other question of where is your, where do you see your life in five years? How would you break that down? And that panned out to about 77% of youth considered that or thought they would be thriving in five years. 18% thought they would be struggling and 6% thought they would be suffering. So we saw an increase in the thriving category and a decrease as to where you thought they would be five years from now. This was really our first time kind of looking at the data. Remember the tentative disclaimer I gave? And one of the things that we noticed was that really across the board, how we looked at the data, when we compared where someone said they were now versus where someone said they would be in their future, the thriving increase and the suffering decreased. It did it to different levels, but no matter how we really looked at the data, the youth in Delaware saw that in five years, they were gonna be doing better than really what they saw now. So that kind of spoke about hope to me. That's just something I kind of wanted to mention. Another way to look at really the same data in that previous slide was just in an average classroom, um, how many youth considered themselves to be thriving which is the green struggling, which is the yellow and red, which is suffering. I mentioned that this was included in Gallup um, and the WIN network, uh, if you guys aren't aware of that, it's the well-being in the nation network, um, which is one of the stakeholders with BSAM that helps promote uh, certain measures being used um, across a number of initiatives, such as being incorporated, this well-being index being incorporated in the Delaware School Survey and other surveys in Delaware. And they're also a proponent, not a proponent, a promoter of using it um, on a national level. And they do have a lot more context in um, on their website, which thank you, Bill, for posting in the chat if people want to learn more. Um, but one of the things you can find there is information around how Gallup uses it. So we wanted to look at what the Delaware adult data says around um, the well-being index versus youth. And these are different years, um, but we just wanted to do a little bit of a comparison. And as you can see here, fewer adults said they were thriving um, when compared to youth, and a lot fewer also said suffering compared to youth. And now we're going to start breaking it out uh, a little bit, um, kind of in those subpopulations or, or kind of looking at more comparisons. And we know that place matters. Um, we know that that there are some variations when we look at youth survey data across the state, when we look at either the county, the sub-county, not always particularly strong differences. I'm looking to Sharon and Jim and Rochelle to see if I can get ahead, not in confirmation of that, but there tend to be some differences across the, across the counties and across the sub-state planning areas. So we wanted to do, we wanted to look at what the eighth graders in our state are saying um, by sub-state planning area and seeing what we could do with a comparison to Gallup. And what really struck me was the similarity um, between the youth and adult in the same geographic area. So Kent County, um, both for youth and adult, had a slightly lower um, mean index scores of the well-being index compared to uh, Sussex County, which had um, higher rates for both youth and adult. Thanks, Bill, for posting. We also looked at a gender breakdown in mean. So the first bar, um, the dark blue one, is looking at the overall eighth grade mean for both present and then the, the table to the right of it is for future. So for present, um, 
Delaware eighth graders um, on average was 7.09. And when we looked at a male and female breakdown of that, males um, were higher than the Delaware average, whereas females were lower. We also saw that same relationship play out in the five-year future category, although not to as big of a not as big of a difference as in the current, whereas the current there's about one rung ladder step difference. And I confirmed with um, uh, a stakeholder over at the WIN network, and there is some evidence to support for adults, not youth, but for adults, for every rung that a population moves up on the ladder that usually equates to 1.25 to 1.5 years gained for that as a population. Um, so again, that's for adults, that's not for youth, but that is something to think about when we're thinking about how an individual places their well-being in their overall life. We know a lot of things feed into that, um, your physical health, your mental health, um, feelings of isolation, feelings of support. Some of that you're gonna see in this data presentation too. We also look at race and um, uh, for future and current well-being. Uh, we looked at black students and white students and how they reported their, um, their well-being index. Not quite as much variation here as we saw in the gender difference. Uh, black students for both current and future uh, had a slightly higher score than white students. Disability status. Um, is another thing that we looked at, disability status among, um, I believe among uh, students overall is somewhere around 30%, um, give or take. I'm also looking for a thumbs up confirmation on that, but I think it's somewhere around, you know, in the 20 to 30% range for youth. And uh, we here, and for the next couple of slides, instead of providing a mean, went back to the breakdown of those three categories I mentioned, the thriving, the struggling, and the suffering. And so we wanted to look at the data for students who, um, who stated they had been medically diagnosed with a physical, emotional, and or learning disability and look at their well-being index. And as you can see, there was quite a bit of difference between students who stated they had been medically diagnosed and the percentage that felt they were thriving versus students who said that they had not been medically diagnosed and the percentage who said they were thriving. About half of the students presently or in the present who, um, who have been medically diagnosed with a physical, emotional learning disability place themselves on the struggling or suffering, which was a pretty big difference than for students who had not. We also did look at the data for um, self-diagnosed and so not medically diagnosed. And there was a little bit of difference, but the, the main takeaway still is the same. So this is one of those there are sometimes data points, I think, that we all kind of come across in our life and they just strike you and um, they motivate you to action, hopefully. And this is one of those for me personally. Um, we looked at students who felt they had no support and encouragement and students who identified um, either parents or teachers or friends or friends' parents and looked at their well-being index. And this, to me, um, motivates me to continue to be engaged in this work on a professional level and it also motivates me on a personal level um, as just someone who cares, cares about youth and cares about their well-being um, to be an engaged, honestly, to be an engaged adult to my nieces and nephews and to other children I know so we can move more youth out of this no one category and make sure they have an adult that they feel supported and encouraged by. And MJ and Terry are both going to speak a little bit about this, but MJ's presentation with uh, protective positive childhood experiences specifically looks at the importance of having two non-parent adults in your life and the benefit that that can have on a youth. And I think this slide kind of gets at that same point. Luckily, the no one category is small compared to the other categories. The vast majority of eighth grade students 
have at least one person they feel supported and encouraged by, but there is still this group who does not. And if we were to continue to dig into this group, I would feel I would feel generally confident that we would probably see some other risk behaviors that as a group we're all trying to protect against um, and we're all trying to mitigate. So um, for me, this was a pretty compelling and a pretty standout um, data point that I wanted to, to share with the group again. It, to me, it sparks an action at both a professional and a personal level. So we also wanted to look at a couple other risks factors, things that um, we tend to sort of pull from the ACEs literature or other work on the SEOW, and we've reported out um, on some similar data points around um, presence of violence um, and being a victim of violence. And so we wanted to look at that in connection with the well-being index score. Um, and as you can see here on the left, this is for youth who had seen or heard violence between adults in their home in the past year. The table on the right is if they were hit by an adult in the past year. Um, and again, for those who had seen violence or who had experienced violence themselves, um, had much higher rates of both suffering and struggling uh, when compared to students who had not seen or heard violence in their home and who had not been victims of the violence in their home as well. Um, you know, we are all about prevention and about substance use prevention as well. Uh, so we wanted to look about substance use and the well-being index. This is the eighth grade survey. So thankfully, knock on wood, we don't have nearly as many students reporting substance use, past month substance use that we do in maybe the 11th grade or definitely in the college risk behavior survey. Uh, so this was a smaller group to work with. Again, that's a good thing. Uh, but we took the substance that was most often reported, the alcohol use, and looked at past month alcohol use um, to see the differences between um, those who stated they had used past month alcohol and those who said they hadn't. And again, we see kind of the data bear out um, around these risk behaviors and uh, the you know, less than half of the students who had engaged in alcohol in the past month also considered themselves to be currently thriving. We did look at other substances as well. We looked at um, vaping, cigarettes, um, marijuana, vaping, cigarettes, marijuana. Yeah, I think those are the other main ones. And those, we could have honestly reported out on those as well, and you would have seen generally the same themes too. So we didn't see a big difference between substances. It was, um, if you engaged in substances, um, according to the eighth grade survey, this is kind of how your well-being index bared out. Now, I know that that was um, a lot of data to go over, and I also know that at the beginning of this meeting, we talked about how this was gonna be a positive meeting, because uh, we were gonna be talking about protective factors and resiliency, and I know that some of that data in there, quite a bit of that data in there, um, maybe wasn't fitting in the positive theme, but the hope is that over time, we can measure well-being index among our Delaware youth to see if there are improvements in how they're categorizing their life now and how they're thinking about their future. This data helps us identify different subpopulations and different groups of youth that we may really want to kind of wrap our arms around with different prevention efforts and different supports, which most, if not all, people on this call are engaged with. So I'm really happy that this group has a really beautiful mix of state agencies, community agencies, um, nonprofits, schools from so many different levels and sectors in Delaware, and we can all sort of use data like this to move things forward and hopefully see over time increase in those thriving proportions and hopefully decreases in the suffering and the struggling. This is the first time we're using this data. Like I said, it is baseline data, it is new to us. So um, we're of course open to feedback and interpretation um, and any other resources that you guys are aware of. Before I close out, I wanna make sure Dana Carr can jump in and share anything. Or just hang out. Awesome. I'm going to try to start my video. It sometimes goes wonky. Hi. Uh, um, I can't see myself. So hopefully, see myself. So hopefully I don't look weird and awkward as I'm sitting here. <laughs> but um, can you hear me? Yep. 
you're breaking up a little bit for me at least. Yeah, I'm going to turn off my video. Yeah, there's something, something weird happens when I turn on my video. Is that better now? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, perfect. Well, I, we just, um, from the DSAM perspective, want to thank you, um, Laura, and all of the UD team um, for this amazing analysis and these data points. This um, is really, really important work as far as DCM is concerned. Um, and mostly we want to thank you for being so flexible with us at DCM and rolling with our new ideas and our um, hey, we've got this thing we want to try, and you guys just go in with it and being awesome. So thank you so much for all of that. Um, we are really excited, as I said, about um, looking at these data and thinking about the possibilities that they present. Um, we have been trying to scale up the use of the well-being index um, in multiple settings um, and are really excited about really building a set of data that we can use um, across different lifespans and in different settings and places and ages and stages. Um, We, over the last couple of years, have been really trying to re-steer a very, very big shift um, from looking at youth um, as a problem population with a whole lot of deficits that we as adults need to fix. Um, and really steering more towards looking at what amazing assets youth bring to the table and how we can enhance and amplify and hold up um, those those assets and build resilience and build all of the good things. Um, And Dr. Lawler, I'm gonna turn it over to her in a minute to talk more about that and how we're working with the Department of Education to really um, build a cross-sector um, multi-stakeholder collaboration around this across the state for our youth. Um, positive youth development, um, we have decades of research and data that show that this is an approach that yields so many benefits and addresses so many um, risk behaviors that we want to reduce in youth. Um, and the reason that I, I find it so exciting, as Laura said, as a parent, as a professional, um, we don't need a lot of fancy curriculum. We don't need fancy programs. We don't need brand new phone apps. Um, we have control over building environments and experiences for ourselves and for our youth and for our own children. Um, as adults, um, we can create positive school climates. We can create positive communities um, where we have positive social norms, where we reduce stigma. Um, and, and at the end of the day, just really building connected, trusted relationships that are honest and authentic um, between each other and with youth and modeling um, those relationships as adults. Um, so that's what I will say. That's kind of the context from which I just wanted to provide that context from where we're coming from in DCM and where we're hoping to move prevention um, kind of in this new era. We all need all the positive we can get in our lives right now. Um, and just trying to be the positive change that we need to see in our world that feels really negative and bad sometimes, but um, just trying to really build up um, what is good in each other and among each other. And um, this morning really built me up because it really, I get to think about all the exciting work that we're doing and think about all the ways that we can connect and all the different partners that we have on the phone and the way we can all work together to really build a stronger double R. So thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm gonna stop talking, turn it back to Laura and to Terry Waller and thanks y'all. Thank you, Dana. Um, Are we opening up to questions, Sharon? Or is that at the end? I'm sorry. No, I think we should um, pause for some questions um, that folks might have at this point. Anybody um, want to join in and ask a question or post in the chat box? Dr. Rapp, it's Bill Lynch, how are you? Hi, good, how are you? <clears throat> good, I got a couple suggestions and I got some questions for you. So first of all, yep. can you actually on your bar graph slides put the ends for the total number and then also the ends and answer it appropriately on those? Mm-hmm. You yep. also give us the other the other substances. You mentioned you had data on vaping, marijuana, and the like. You only showed alcohol. I get that. Yeah. Slides would be great. And here's the reason why. Yeah. I'll in have New to Jersey, double check the ends on those. 
sorry. Okay. So for those we may not be able to report, we may not be able to publicly report out on based on the ends, just because you know the eighth grade data. If it was the eleventh grade data set, I, we could, you know, unfortunately report out across a variety of substances. But with the eighth, I'll have to double check. But they were they were close to our cutoff um, of being able to report out, which is one of the few reasons why we did alcohol. But I didn't. I cut you off, and I apologize for that. No, no, I'm that's not fine. Sure we'll be able to do that one. That's fine. The other reason I'm listening. because what we have already seen in New Jersey is by county and by state. What I would really like to see is if you can repeat this post COVID-19 and I don't want to be negative, but I think your numbers will be different and in a negative direction, but we're using that information to actually uh, send to legislators and those making decisions, both in healthcare systems and for the counties and the states, because they have already considered cutting these budgets even though we've seen an increase in the need for these services. So that's why mm -hmm. I have great baseline data before, if there's ways to get data significantly for after and show that there's even a more dire need for these services to continue and to be added to. That's what we're trying to do now because we are feeling this impact tremendously in New Jersey in a negative direction. And I anticipate it will be here as well. And if there's ways to show before and after, that's a way to hopefully sustain some of these services to continue. Yeah. Uh, Laura, no, I, I think that's a great point. Laura, can I make a statement to that? Um, Dr. Yep. Birmingham and I have been ensuring that mental health questions, substance use questions, and all those, we're not, usually when the surveys get updated, we try to make sure we're using the best language. But for this year, we are going to make ensure that all the language and mental health and uh, substance use are asked in the exact same manner. And that way we will be able to do a, a cross year comparison and that that is something that's been discussed and we're planning to move forward with that as we collect more data to see uh, yearly changes. So uh, Bill, just let you know that that is a top priority on the survey team um, agenda as we move forward with this year's administration. Thanks, Jim. Do we have any other um, questions based on the uh, wellness index? I do want to mention that um, uh, Bill and Isla have been popping different uh, links into the chat box. We're going to make sure you get all of this information after the meeting as well, but um, a number of resources they've already shared. Um, I have a question, I guess is a question. Um, I think it would, maybe it's more of a comment. <laughs> um, I, I guess I, I wonder, you know, when we start this aggregating by race or gender or, or whatever it is, and we're looking at those ratings, um, sorry, I'm trying to articulate this. I wonder how, if there are differences in sort of the lived experience of the different groups, and how that affects how they rate things. And I guess because I wonder if a child described by these characteristics, having the same experience as a child described by these characteristics would rate the same way. So like if I am a white child and I have seen violence and I don't have an adult outside of my parent, do I still, and as opposed to a black child who has those same characteristics, do they perceive their worlds differently? And I know this isn't a question, I mean, it would be an interesting thing to, to start chopping up the data to say, okay, you know, and, and I don't know, I don't know, I just find that an interesting thing to explore, starting mm -hmm. with the, the quantitative data. I think that intersectionality and what you mentioned is the reality. No one is just one thing. And we often look at the data as this versus that, this versus that, which doesn't bear out what the complexities of any individual and what we experience in life. I think the well, so yes, I agree with you. I think, I think those are great future steps. Uh, we do, I think those are, I think, those are good future steps. I don't think we're there right now with this. Right. Um, we have some fabulous graduate students at CDAS, uh, Bill being one of them, thanks Bill, who are doing a wonderful job with a lit review um, on this 
particular index just to kind of pull from the field and see and see how other people have used it. And it's been used um, in publications to look at, you know, many different groups that we're interested in in Delaware and SEOW, um, you know, obviously youth with disabilities, um, uh, women with depression, women with HIV, general population, um, individuals who do substance use, individuals who do tobacco in general or specifically. So it's it's been used a lot and I think we're getting our legs with future steps of how we can use this particular index um, in the Delaware School Survey data, as well as, as Dana mentioned, in other data, because this is being incorporated into a variety of instruments throughout the state, not just this one. Um, I think our team is building our legs to do those sorts of analyses, um, and I think that's where our eye is, but it's not our capacity. We're trying to learn the data first before we do, do additional steps. Oh, sure. I just think it would be fun to get in there and mess around with the data, <laughs> frankly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question. Um, I just looking at the eighth grade data and um, Bill Lynch's comment about some of the other um, variables, and of course, I'm particularly interested in tobacco use and vaping. And um, so, I'm wondering what is the possibility of actually getting access to the eighth grade data from the Delaware School Survey? Um, and what will be the process for doing that? That is honestly a, a Jim and Rochelle question, and I think that would be something they would also need to discuss with any um, funders. I'm not sure if they want to speak to it now, but I don't. I don't have an answer. Sorry, Liz. Okay. Hey, Liz. Um, if you, we can trade some emails offline, um, just because there are some safeguards in place because we tend not to report out in certain ways, um, but we can certainly help you in other ways. So shoot us an email after this and we can, we can help look you up, okay? Thank you. Okay, so I think, um, thank you, Laura. As I said, I just love this data and I do think that there was a little bit more than I'd heard from the last time. I think it had done a little more analysis since then. Um, I think it's a great way to segue into MJ's piece, which is on uh, positive childhood experiences. I'm going to give a little bit of a spoiler alert that we are uh, in the process of the um, at the SEOW of producing uh, one of our gap reports and it's going to be on this very topic of you know positive and protective factors because again we really want to start fostering that asset building and and um, I think you said it, there are lots of simple things that can be done that can be used to promote um, the well-being in kids. And so we're very uh, excited to be moving on in this fashion. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to MJ now, who has done a wealth of work in this area, not only in her capacity at the SEOW, but in her former work um, as a mental health uh, clinician. And I'm going to turn it over to her to set the table, and then she's going to present on her data as well as introduce Terry Lawler. So thank you very much, Laura, and we're gonna move on now to MJ. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, everybody. Um, as Sharon mentioned, I am super excited about this, um, working with children and families. Um, you know, sometimes our, our work can be very difficult and sometimes we look at we look at a lot of stuff That's not always positive right trauma abuse and so on and uh, I know as a, a professional and also as a researcher uh, And as a mom looking at what can we do to make it better? What can we do to build on the things that are already going well and prevent some of the things that are, are not going very well as uh, Sharon mentioned we do have a um, a more robust report coming out. So this is just gonna be an overview. Uh, and as well, uh, Isla is in, in a few minutes going to drop in the infographic that we did, which many of you folks uh, already received and, and provided feedback. So thank you for that. Um, and let's get started. Uh, positive childhood experiences are those opportunities and advantages in childhood that increase the likelihood of healthy development 
there are not the absence of ACEs, right? So it's not the lack of abuse or the lack of poverty, uh, but they are those experiences and those events in our childhood that um, can be protective against the, the poor outcomes associated with ACEs. I did drop three uh, studies here for you for your review. When you do get the slides, these are live links, so you're able to look at some of the research yourself. Uh, the first study was about 15,000 people and took a look at family and school connectedness, and they found that there were long-term positive effects into adulthood, and those effects cover the gamut of mental health, sexual risk behavior, domestic violence, and substance use disorder. The next one by uh, Bethel, we use this as a launching pad for a lot of our work um, around this topic, started the infographic. Um, Terry Lawler is going to get into that more in her uh, presentation, I believe. And um, what they did was they did a retrospective study using Berkus data out of Wisconsin, and they looked at about 6,000 adults. And those adults who reported uh, these positive childhood experiences had lower odds of depression or poor mental health and had uh, higher rates of social and emotional support into adulthood. Um, and then finally, that positive childhood experience and positive adult functioning study was about 400 uh, individuals that looked at uh, from about age of 11 to 22 uh, and followed them over time. And this um, more ch positive childhood experiences was correlated with less adolescent substance use, which was then looked at in adulthood and, and they um, found some effects there as well. There are some limitations, obviously, to these studies that I want to throw out to you right in advance. Um, the middle one, which was about 14, excuse me, which about 6,000 individuals was a fairly homogenous group in Wisconsin. And we know from the ACES study, uh, we've got to open it up to diversity and, and, and diverse experiences, as Dr. Ackerman mentioned a moment ago. Um, and the last study there on the page was about 400 youth but uh, it took part, uh, place in a primarily rural setting. So there's more work that needs to be done here. Um, the Bethel study that we talked about um, devised a score, a PCE score, and their focus was primarily relationships. So they used a resiliency um, scale, which Isla will, uh, my colleague Isla will drop in the chat for you if you want to have some, you know, look at that yourself. But these different domains of resilience that take place in school, take place in relationships, and they build this score on these seven factors. Being able to talk to your family about their feelings, uh, feeling that your family stood by them during difficult times, uh, enjoyed participating in community traditions, felt a sense of belonging in high school, and felt supported by your friends. Had at least two non-parent adults who took genuine interest in them, and felt safe and protected by an adult in their home. And I do want to give a, a shout out to my uh, colleagues at the center, Rachel Riding, Bill Bratton, and Wen Jin Wong, who helped uh, with the data on this. And we did take a look. Um, we don't have one-to-one -one questions for these, right? But we have ones that are very close. Um, we ask about who gives you support and encouragement. Dr. Rapp mentioned that a few moments ago. And we were able to use some of that data to uh, look at how many people are giving folks support and encouragement. Um, this is slightly distant, that obviously, than protective factors, uh, characteristics and resources that may mitigate the effects of adversity and promote resilience. Um, these two things work in tandem with one another. Uh, Bill, I think, earlier dropped a link about risk and protective factors from SAMHSA. And which happen at the different levels, right? Your, your individual, your social, your family uh, levels, school levels, community levels. Um, and uh, if you're not familiar with the Harvard uh, Resiliency work, their Center for Childhood Development, I encourage you to take a look at that. They've got a great game, I'm putting great game in quotes, um, about resilience, about filling your buckets, uh, and how protective factors really, you know, fill that bucket. So when these ACEs happen, when these risk factors occur or are present, we're able to balance out um, some of those effects. And so I know for, for me, again, as Dr. Rapp mentioned, this is a personal and professional passion. Uh, we can't control everything that happens. We can, you know, work to reduce those risks. Um, but as much as we can feed into children and nurture children, um, to fill their protective bucket or fill their positive childhood experience, 
um, the, the science is out there that that helps protect or, or, or um, mitigate against long-term negative effects. We did take a look at um, Delaware data using both school surveys, both the Delaware School Survey and the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. Um, more than 63% of Delaware Middle School students reported that they talk to their parents often or always think about, or always, often or always, excuse me, about things that matter. And for me, that's really important because, uh, you know, we picked middle school here uh, because that's that, if you work with young people, you know that that can be a real difficult time moving from, from elementary school into the big pond of high school. And um, thinking about back to that scale about feeling connected with our parents or, or feeling that our family members care, can you talk to um, the parent, your parents uh, about things that matter? And uh, the, the, excuse me, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey and the Delaware School Survey spell this out a lot. Are they proud of you? Do they take interest in your activities? Do they listen to you when you talk? And so even though it's not an exact measure, we get a full picture of how children feel communication is going with their parents so, um, and caregivers. 72% of Delaware Middle School students reported that their parents often or always listen when they talk, which is really huge uh, for children to feel heard, obviously. Um, 67% 60 of Delaware Middle School students reported that their parents often or always take interest in their activities, uh, which is huge. So as we're listening, as we're taking interest, both as, as professionals and parents, here are some of the things that, that children are hearing or youth, young people are hearing us talk about. Um, 11th grade Delaware students reported that in the last, um, excuse me, in the last period, that they're 33%, 36 uh, percent talk to them about uh, the risks of using alcohol or drugs and then 33 percent told them not to drink alcohol and 41 percent told them not to use drugs so uh, I think this kind of you know kids are listening they feel heard we need to keep talking about this keep weaving this into the to the conversation um, I will say uh, as a again as a professional as a parent telling our kids not to do something is not always effective. So um, talking to them about the risk, talking to them about their impacts is, is huge. So taking the opportunity to do that. And about 94% of Delaware high school students have talked to um, have talked with their parents or other family adults uh, within the last year or 12 to 24 months about what they expect uh, young people to do when it comes to sex. And I want to pause here for a minute and say even though we ask about parents, uh, I think that there's a role for everyone in the family uh, unit, and we do ask about support and encouragement, brothers and sisters, grandparents, so on. Um, we're not touching that here. We will get into that more in the report that Sharon mentioned, but there is the opportunity for all adults to feed in to, um, uh, to fill that bucket for our young people. Uh, another aspect of that is feeling safe, feeling safe in school and feeling safe in your neighborhood. Um, you know, in fifth grade, uh, students reported, about 94% of students reported feeling safe in their schools, uh, about 88% in their neighborhood, which I think is, is great. Um, eighth grade, 74% feeling safe in school, 82% feeling safe in their neighborhood. 11th grade, uh, feeling safe in their school or in their neighborhood. The important thing here to note is that with fifth graders, we just ask yes or no. Most of the time, do you feel safe? Uh, yes or no. Um, with the secondary DSS survey, we do ask often or most of the time. So those, um, don't know what you'd call that color. You'll forgive me, I'm not uh, too color savvy. Green, blue, some mix in between, um, represents those students who, who answered that question that they often feel safe in those environments or most of the time. Um, and uh, in conclusion, I do want to wrap it up so we can keep moving um, with, our, with our session here. But these things are working together and they work together that, so that young people can feel a sense of support, safety, and encouragement. And that lays a really solid foundation for adulthood. And I think that that is uh, critically important. I think the data supports that. Um, back to the well being index, having that future orientation is essential to, to hope. Um, but there is more work to be done. This particular study, like I mentioned, is, uh, you know, created a scale with certain domains, which should be in the chat for you there. Um, but there are other areas to look at positive childhood experiences, whether it's in the school. On the infographic, we mentioned uh, the percentage of youth that feel respected by their teachers, 
Um, and then we need to replicate these studies in diverse populations. Uh, the, the studies right now are not in, in, in happening in that way, but we um, further work is, is there to be done. So I know that was very quick, uh, but were there any questions or comments either from the chat or if people want to unmute themselves? No, I'm going to say that there's no questions. Um, I don't have a question, but um, yes. thank you for talking about PCEs and the work that you guys are doing on it. I think it's, it's a great conversation to be having and, and a great um, new way to continue to look at um, some of the existing data and some of the measures we already have in the surveys. Um, so thank you for sharing it. Yeah, um, this is uh, this is my passion. I love it. Uh, thanks for, for taking the ride uh, with us, folks. Next, it is my uh, pleasure to introduce, uh, I'm sorry, I apologize. Here's the references for you. These are all live links. When you get the slides, it'll take you out to both the school surveys as well as some of the research that's available for you. Uh, next, it is my privilege and my pleasure to introduce Terry Lawler. Um, she is the current Education Associate for Trauma-Informed Practices and Social-Emotional Learning uh, for the Delaware Department of Education. She was a 2010 Delaware School Psychologist of the Year and a founding member of Trauma Matters Delaware, Delaware's Compassionate Schools Learning Collaborative, as well as the City of Wilmington's Advisory Council for Youth Gun Violence Prevention. Uh, many of you know Terry Lawler. She is an amazing partner. She is a uh, passionate warrior for young people as well as uh, you know, promoting self-care in adults so that we can uh, work all work better together. So uh, turn it over to you, Ms. Lawler. All right, thank you all so much for having me today. Uh, MJ, are you going to do my slides? I will, ma'am. Uh, it's a separate slide deck. One moment, it's okay. coming. All right, well, it'll give me a chance to just uh, say a couple things. First of all, I feel like I'm among kindred spirits and I'm so grateful. You know, you never know how things are going to work out. Uh, but just the opportunity to have this discussion is so, um, just warms my heart. And, and, and I really feel great about being here with you all. Number one, uh, I can't have this discussion without saying that I stand on the shoulders of people who knew how to love and nurture children. And so I grew up with a lot of privilege. I grew up understanding that my life meant something and that there was legacy and involved in, in my heart. And so with that, uh, I was also privileged to grow up with five grandparents, okay? I had my father's parents, my mother's parents, and my great grandma in my life until I was a freshman in college. I lost my first grandparent as a freshman in college. And so just the idea that one, my mother is one of nine. My father is one of four. I got lots of cousins, lots of family, lots of community. And I was everybody's child, if you can imagine what that means. And so in the midst of all that might have gone on in the world, I'm a product, I grew up in the 60s, okay? I, grew, I was born in 63. I don't tell a lot of people that. So it shouldn't go beyond this call. But <laughs> I, I'm, you know, I know that with all that was going on in the world at that time, my family, my community was a buffer and an insulator for me. And as a result, my life is a product of the hope and opportunity that was bridged by strong relationships. And so it is my honor to share with you the work that's going on in the Delaware Department of Ed, because I think that sums it up. Our intent is to have our schools create that buffer. We use a real ecological model where uh, we don't just want strength within the school community. We want that strength to sort of uh, band out in concentric circles to families and caregivers and out of school time partners and everyone who's uh, willing to link arms to support children because that is how you build resilience. You build resilience in a community that is filled with resilience. And so, um, so excited to share that work with you all today uh, about how we are bridging hope and opportunity. We know a lot about adversity, but we know that we can make a difference with positive experiences uh, 
and uh, protective factors for our students. So thank you. Uh, MJ, you can go forward. I often use this slide in a lot of my presentations and, and I use it sort of as, as a grounding for myself, but I, I want to change the language up a little bit because I think we need to recognize that it's the key is really connection and belonging. So students who have connection and belonging in their lives come to school ready to learn. But when that is lacking, it's our responsibility to create systems of connection and belonging that will help them thrive and move on to higher heights in their lives. We talk a lot about Maslow's triangle, but that work really started as stair steps. And so it's taking the next step, you know, again, bridging <laughs> That, con that bridge from connection and belonging is what gets us to achievement and accomplishment. And so we want to create that for all of our learners. Thank you, MJ. Bruce Perry said this quote in 2016, okay? This was pre-COVID, 2016, a lot of thought in his mind about the virus of adversity and adverse childhood experiences, how trauma and toxic stress was impacting the brain and keeping young people, individuals of all ages from being their best selves. And he said then that it, you know, in agreement with the CDC, that it was at a national health crisis level and needed immediate attention. You know, whether that comes in the form of a vaccine or just an a, a arm full of caring people, uh, it matters. And we have to band together to attack, in many ways, the uh, toxic stress that's impacting brain development, but also functioning for so many people in our society. Keep going, please. I often say that, you know, if my house, if my neighbor's house is on fire, my house is at risk. Okay, so it doesn't matter. Um, it matters more. It, how do I say this? <laughs> it doesn't just matter what happens in my house. It matters what's happening around me. When my neighbor's house is on fire, my siding could, could burn, my shrubbery can burn. So there are lots of vulnerability um, that needs to be focused on as a community. It doesn't just matter what happens for me. It happens uh, me and my house, but as well as every house around me. Uh, often we hear that there are two ways that things can go wrong. And they're quite simply when things don't happen for children and when things happen that shouldn't happen. And so when we talk about this in our schools, we talk about it just that way. MJ, I'm going to nod and you can keep me going so we can uh, stay on time. There we go. All right. And so the CDC says that the key is really building safe, nurturing, stable environments, all but with a foundation of strong relationships. Next slide, please. And the way we create those safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments is fundamental to healthy development and school success. And so uh, in addition to focusing on the assets of our learners, we have to focus on the assets of the adults who support them, that's our educators and our school staff, as well as their caregivers and community members. Next slide. The Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, uh, we are doing lots of basic awareness level training around this, and we've been doing it for a number of years. I joined the department in November of 2018, but this was work that was near and dear to my heart for about 10 years prior to that. And it started with discussions around disproportionality and how we could best support students who were struggling and having difficulty in school. Many of them identified as special education students, and so they were already uh, receiving some significant school supports. But in a number of cases, we weren't getting the outcomes or the results from all, or a good return on investment for all that we were putting in. That uh, hunger, to, uh, thirst to do better, kind of drove me to the literature and in that discovered the impact of adverse childhood experiences. You can, you can go forward, please. Since then, we recognize that there's a, real, a lot of really great work going on in neighboring states. 
uh, Philadelphia as well as Baltimore added some additional questions to their to the original 10 and they are they were looking very closely at community violence and the impact of poverty homelessness not having those basic needs met and what that meant to um, a student's capacity to feel safe physically and psychologically in the world, but also to connect with others, connect with the content that we're providing in schools and really be their best selves in the school environment. Next slide, please. At our last census, we knew that 51% of Delaware children had experienced at least one adversity uh, before the age of 18. And the projection was that 23% had experienced two or more. I want to show you this next slide so you'll see essentially what how dramatic those numbers can be in a school setting uh, because the thought is that about four to six students in each class have experienced enough traumatic experiences or chronic stress in their lifetimes that it can dysregulate them and impair their productivity in a school setting. Next slide please. And so we, uh, the Department of Ed has partnered with Pure Edge to really look closely at how we support our students, uh, but in particular, how we create safe and supportive environments so that our educators can present themselves optimally in the school setting. And Pure Edge, if people are not familiar, uh, Pure Edge, has been our partner for the last year. They provided all of our educators the Headspace app in June of 2019. Uh, the thought was that in order to pour from a full well and co-regulate with students, the adults needed to be highly regulated. Uh, and so we've been encouraging mindfulness-based stress reduction for a number of years, but had it at the ready on our cell phones uh, for the last year. And we had no idea how badly we were going to need it this school year in particular. So this is some recent data that Pure Edge has been working with, just looking at the importance of our preparations for restart and recovery for the upcoming school year. Next slide, please. In addition, previous year's data has taught us that schools pay a high price when we don't give attention to the impact of adversity and stress on our learners as well as our staff. Uh, we have educators new to the field who are leaving within five years just uh, by virtue of not feeling equipped to meet the needs and demands of the work setting. We have uh, chronic burnout and fatigue uh, many of our teachers are stressed with additional uh, demands, whether it is testing and accountability. And so we've tried as much as possible to integrate our work around whole child, whole person development into our multi-tiered systems of support frameworks so that it does not feel like another thing that we're asking our uh, workforce to do, but it becomes a real part of the value system and the fabric of our work. Next slide, please. Oh, and all of my statistics are coming up. There we go. <laughs> all right. And so we know that the mirror neurons in our brain, we focused a lot on the neuroscience of adversity and how the brain develops in our professional learning. And so we know that those mirror neurons really make stress contagious. So there's research that says that Students are more stressed, uh, more anxious in environments where teachers are anxious and dysregulated. And so we focused a lot on the importance of building regulation into the school day and helping our teachers be best regulated to uh, impact the environment of their classrooms. We want them not to be thermometers, but thermostats so that they are setting the temperature, the emotional tone of the class, and really scanning often so that they can get in and support and meet needs co -regulate with, by co-regulating with students. Next slide. And so our work has been framed in a community resilience model. Uh, one of the honors upon taking this job 
was the opportunity to create the strategic plan around trauma-informed practices and social and emotional learning. So the next few slides that I'm going to show you are part of the state strategic plan. And we began with a shared understanding of adversity and we focused a lot on toxic stress, that chronic stress that uh, impedes our functioning. We talk about it in terms of our learners, but also our adults, recognizing that uh, we can't teach and support if we don't have a certain level of mastery ourselves. Uh, but we want to build capacity in the adults as well as every adult that we partner with. And so that includes our out of school time partners, community centers, the very same trainings that we do for educators, we've not only extended to community members, but we've also reached back into the pipeline and we extend those to our higher education partners so that we are training uh, and cultivating a pipeline of educators who have this information. This is not information that many of us learned when we were in college. And so uh, being able to translate research to practice has been so important for us in our current work paradigm. We also uh, thrive <laughs> within community. And so we focus a lot on community engagement and working with our cross-sector um, other youth serving agencies so that we can meet the needs of the uh, young people that we serve. Next slide. And so the work is grounded in our Delaware developmental framework for trauma informed practices. Uh, this we're using across the state since Governor Carney signed Executive Order 24 in October of 2018. And our focus, and you'll see an upcoming slide where it talks about the specific learning activities that are a part of our focus. Next slide. I think it's, uh, this, there are three strategic intents for the work. We recognized early on that there was work that needed to take place within the Department of Education, as well as out to our districts and charters. And so some of the very same intervention systems and that we talk about for our school communities we are using within the department. So uh, while uh, many have not been able to visit lately, if you visit anytime soon, you'll notice that there are walking spaces as well as uh, murals that can be colored in community. We have calming stations throughout Towns End building, uh, places where our adults can focus on their regulation and getting the support that they need to show up as best they can in their work. We also have focused a lot on system integration. So uh, really making sure there was coherence and alignment within the department, but even out to our agency partners all around our whole child, whole person work. Next slide, please. And so this captures the capacity building progression that we have. Uh, using our information about adversity, but also pairing it with strategies to build resilience. So uh, in each category, I've in identified learning activities, book studies, as well as trainings that we can use to move us in on that trajectory. Uh, we pivoted very quickly after the middle of May to host every single training online. And um, I was telling Sharon in the chat earlier, it is not uncommon for me to sit in the midst of three computers trying to keep everything going. Uh, but we have been making sure, uh, putting a lot of effort into making sure that our educators have a lot of support this summer uh, and lots of opportunities to translate what we are learning into our daily practices in preparation for the coming school year. Next slide, please. And so we have built in, layered in SAMHSA's four R's into our work uh, with learning activities focused on uh, brain science and intersections of inequality and trauma at the realization stage. Uh, during the recognition stage, we want to identify uh, times of dysregulation and combat that 
with some strategies to build resilience. We have built in brain breaks and energizers and mindfulness practices uh, as a way of responding, but also pre-responding, if you can think of it that way, recognizing that there are cycles uh, to behavior. Again, wanting our educators to be prepared to meet the needs of learners in the midst of challenge. And challenge comes from many directions throughout our typical school day, whether in person or in a virtual paradigm. And so we want to make sure that we are building in regulation, helping our young people understand the ebbs and flows of life and using those coping strategies, whether it's deep breathing, mindfulness practices, using an energizer. Uh, the intent is really to have an expanded repertoire of coping skills so that they can move in and out of uh, times of stress with resilience. Next slide, please. All right, great. And so mindfulness really becomes a universal strategy for us to build physical, psychological, and emotional safety. In that uh, foundation, we rely on strong relationships, not just student to student, but also adult to adult and student to adult. Uh, we measure what we value. And so uh, in this process, we've set up assessment systems. That's why it was so important to partner with Laura and her team for the analysis to action series so that we really understand how to use the data that we have at hand to make good decisions, but more importantly, to create and shape the outcomes that we want for our learners and our school communities. And lastly, we've embedded a foundation of social emotional learning practices of recently releasing K-12 competencies for our state and providing lots of professional learning so that we know how to embed those strategies within our academic practices. Next slide. The next project I'm gonna talk a little bit about, um, you haven't heard a lot about, but in the coming days, you're going to hear more. Last fall, uh, Delaware was named one of five states to be awarded trauma recovery demonstration project grants from the U.S. Department of Education. So it's Delaware, Alaska, Hawaii, Nevada, and Louisiana, all very different in our needs, but given the charge of developing a structure so that the Department of Education could pay mental health providers directly for trauma-specific recovery services for our children. Uh, not we want to uh, reduce the stigma around accessing mental health supports, number one, but also in the revolving door. We really believe that hope and healing is possible, but it takes place in community, just like adversity and trauma often takes place in relationship that healing must take place in healing-centered relationships. And so while 85% of those funds are committed to specific mental health supports, that other 15% of those funds are committed to system integration and creating a training institute that is multidisciplinary where educators and our mental health providers, school base and community can come together to collaborate and learn the concepts, the strategies that support each other's work. And so you'll be hearing more about Project Thrive in the coming weeks as we launch. <laughs> and so we believe that we can truly tip the scales on adversity with positive childhood experiences. Uh, just like those experiences have worked for you and I, we want to create more of them for our students. And so we're using the very data that uh, MJ referred to later. MJ, I'll go through these slides fairly quickly because you've already covered this information. Next slide, please. And we want to um, use our assessment strategies to not just measure uh, what may be going wrong in a child's life, we also want to uh, take a look at those assets, those uh, protective factors that 
may be built into the system, but also recognizing that that low-lying fruit gives us an opportunity, a point of intervention where we can go in and support young people as well as their caregivers and the educators who serve them. Next slide. And so we are focused a lot on the brain changes that take place with positive experiences. We have data that supports the benefits of meditation, our, our mindful breathing strategies, and also lots of research coming out. And I think Laura said this, this is fairly new science, but we've got data that's coming out and showing that um, academic skills, reading, the acquisition of reading skills is improved, not only in children, but also adults, when we integrate some of those positive experiences in learning settings. Next slide. This data, I believe, came from Wisconsin, and it talks about, um, in their study of the behavioral risk factor surveillance system that they use, it talks about the measurement of those positives and how 72% lowering of the odds when you have six to seven positive childhood experiences. Uh, there, there are repercussions or there are positive implications for mental health, but also quality of life. And that's so important when thinking about the young people that we work with. Next slide. And even when in the presence of adversity, there's still positives that come. So still lots of assets, lots of opportunities to build resilience. Next slide. And just another, uh, and we'll send these out, but just another, another slide showing great support that no matter how many adversities you have in your life, having those positives buffer, but they also mitigate. And so it's so important uh, for us when thinking about healing-centered engagement and ways to create hope and opportunity for us to incorporate and really focus on building as many positive experiences and protective factors for our young people as we can. Next slide. Next slide, please. All right, and so uh, we began by cultivating more of a hope-informed lens. We want to change the questions that we ask. Uh, rather than our traditional questions about you know, what happened or what went wrong for a student, we really want to focus on some of the positive things and what is working for them. What are the assets that are working for them and their families? And all families have assets. Um, next slide, please. I think uh, we build meaningful connections and uh, they can be as sophisticated as this young teacher from North Carolina who has a specific handshake for everyone in his class. But uh, we tell our educators that they don't even have to be that creative. Just sitting down and talking two minutes a day with a young person over a 10 day period will build connection. Sharing a little bit about yourself, talking about your own experiences and how you cope with got through challenges, bounce back from challenges in your own life uh, provides a great model for vicarious learning. Next slide. This is the one I wanted to show. So when we're reframing and uh, focusing, often in our intake processes or our early assessments, and uh, we look at what's wrong. We're really trying to change the lens and focus on what is right. And while there may be, look like there's a lot of chaos going on in the family picture here, some of the strengths are that mom has connection because she's talking on the phone. There is family literacy because there are books around. She ha actually has her hand on a book. There are pets in the family. The children have access to um, the outside world through the television and their toys around. And so while often we go in looking for what we can do, what we can offer, we have to stay focused on building relationships. I think we get so much further by building relationships, coming alongside and creating allyships with caregivers and helping them identify what's really working right that we can use as a foundation and build and move forward from there. Next slide. And so with that, we are shifting our focus to incorporate 
family protective factors as well. And so in addition to supporting young people, we want to cultivate relationships with families so that we uh, build not just a strong individual, but a strong community, a strong family uh, becomes strength in the community. And so that is where we are focusing on with many of our efforts in the Department of Education right now. Uh, with that, I, I know my time is running out. I'll, I'll breeze through these next few slides because there is a lot of great work going on around HOPE. And uh, right in Massachusetts, there's a project called HOPE, Health Outcomes for Positive Experiences, and they focus on four building blocks strong relationships, strong environments, maximum opportunities for engagement, and social and emotional development. Uh, and uh, in our schools, we are seeking to do all of those things. We're putting a great deal of effort into building relationships and maximizing opportunities for SEL as a universal practice. And we know that through that engagement and uh, reaching out in those concentric circles to all of the environments that are wrapped around our young people, we really can build not only stronger school performance, but stronger performance in life in general. So I thank you. I, I'm thrilled for any opportunity that I have to share the work that's going on in our schools. And I thank you for having me today. Thank you so much, Terry. Um, that was a great overview and a great presentation. It's very inspiring uh, to see all of the simple things that we can do to help promote um, protective factors and resilience, but it's also very gratifying to see the steps that are taking place, particularly in the Department of Education, because it's such, a, such an important space for our youth. But I particularly appreciated that aspect of your presentation that focused on helping the teachers and their stress level and the educators and their stress level because i don't think my mind goes to that so often but yet we know how important that is so having said that i know we've run a little long but um, we do want to take and give an opportunity for a few questions for terry um, if anyone has a question please unmic yourself and and ask or you can put it in the um you can put it in the chat box. Sharon, this is MJ. Uh, yes. Again, I want to second what Sharon said. I have to tell you, I was a little slow on the transition because, of course, Ms. Lawler, I'm always taking notes when you're talking. So I was like taking notes and changing and chicken. So thank you for that. But for our friends uh, who are our partners who are here that may be not familiar with the concept of regulation or dysregulation, could you just very briefly, uh, you know, give a one on one kind of primer on the idea of regulation and dysregulation? Sure, and I'll share with you one of the concepts that we are using with our educators, but also uh, has started using with our students. And it's from Dan Siegel's Hand Model of the Brain. Many people have heard of it, but just in case, he talks about uh, the brain as being a tight knit system and it functions best when everything is tightly held together. But there are times and, and that it has areas of function. And so I'll back up. The uh, brain stem represented by sort of the heel of my hand is where the parasympathetic nervous system is. Things happen automatically like our breathing and our sleeping. In the midbrain, we have the functioning for our motor skills. The limbic system is housed in the center of the brain and the, at the heart of it is the amygdala and the hypothalamus represented by the thumb. And then the prefrontal cortex, the top of the brain where thinking and reasoning takes place, is represented by my curled fingers. And essentially what he says is that when we get upset, when we get agitated, we get nervous, we feel any discomfort in the system, the amygdala gets wiggly and the top of the brain gets disconnected from the bottom of the brain. He calls that flipping your lid. When you have a flip lid, that is dysregulation. And we tell our educators, we never want two flip lids in communication with each other. So think about that. Uh, lots of family members in the house these days, if mom's lid is flipped and dad's lid is flipped, not gonna be a good dinner. So we want everybody to stay as regulated as possible. And to do that, we have to learn strategies to calm and bring 
regulation uh, back to the physical system. That way, the top fingers curl down and the brain becomes uh, tight again, and you're able to think, make good decisions at the top of the brain. Uh, so some of the strategies that we're using for regulation are all around uh, portable skills that we have at the ready all the time, like our breathing. Our breath is with us all the time. And when you take a deep breath, you engage the vagus nerve that has contact with every organ in the body and creates vitality and health in the physical system. And so just those simple practices on a regular basis can help us create more regulation in our lives. And our uh, definition of that is creating more space between our immediate reaction and our ability to respond when things go wrong. And so um, a very simple strategy that we can use, but that we use with our educators as well as our, our students. And it's pretty amazing to see the uh, little guys <laughs> trying some of those deep breath, uh, breathing exercises, doing body scans, and talking about this information in relation to uh, how they feel and whether or not they're productive and able to be productive for work in, on a particular school day. That, that's a great illustration of it. Thank you so much. Do we have uh, maybe one other question? Um, anyone else want to ask anything? There's a great deal in your presentation, a lot. I mean, and I'm really grateful for you uh, presenting it, but also that you're going to let us share that with the group um, and post it because I think there's a lot of, lot of food for thought there. Um, and uh, I, I really appreciate the way that the presentations today sort of flowed mm -hmm. from wellness down into, you know, like the weeds of resilience. That's probably not a good analogy, but, you know, I mean, it is so core and um, it's, it's just uh, really important for us to be able to build on the positives. And it's important too. you mentioned something in passing. We're currently at a point in our state where we have been, um, We've been lucky enough to be in a setting where there's tremendous universal focus on being trauma informed and cultivating resilience. So I think the work that's going on in the schools is consistent with what we're doing in the state. And I think that it's really tremendous that we've got the Department of Education working so closely with DSAM, so closely with public health, so closely with kids, because it truly does have to be you know, uh, a whole blanket affair, I think. So thank you for that. Yes, um, we're delighted to have had all the presentations today. I, I know we're running long. We always run long because we have such rich conversations, but I did want to give all of our members a chance to make any announcements or provide any updates that they might want to share before we wrap up. Um, does anyone, have anything you can either drop it in the chat box or feel free to unmike yourself and just share with the group anything that you would like that's happening in your organization uh, that you'd like to give some publicity to okay i know for us as we said we'll have the epi report coming out later and we will also have um the uh the gap report on positive childhood experiences protective factors and resilience coming out later anybody else want to share anything Sharon, hi it's, it's dana uh, we actually have Oops, go ahead we actually have um attack addictions actually still having virtually support meetings so both people who have grieved the loss of someone's substance use disorder or experiencing uh, having a family member who has substance use disorder they're actually going on the second Tuesday. People go out to attack the website. They can actually find those virtual meetings and still participate in those. Uh, the other one is we actually do have a presentation on COVID-19 already seeing the devastating impact. So if that would be a benefit to this group or other people who are listening, uh, that's already been presented uh, both nationally and also uh, we've presented to our medical school with the emergency room physicians because of all the stuff that we've seen. Uh, what's staggering about it is there's uh, data now that shows that even with the increase in mortality during this time frame from COVID-19, COVID-19 does not account for all of those deaths. 
So there's a significant data that shows that other causes of mortality have increased as well significantly due to the COVID-19 outbreak. And in New York City, they actually show the time frame from 2019 of last year that their out of hospital cardiac arrests had a 75% mortality rate. But during 2020, with this in COVID-19, the mortality rate was over 90%. So it's significant with regards to people delaying seeking care that they've actually have led to increased mortality. So some of that information is included in there to go over what's actually happening with COVID-19 to those who are infected and those who are also affected who may not be infected. Yeah. That is, that is pretty significant. And thank you for sharing the information about the attack addictions meetings. I think uh, Dana, you were gonna, you were gonna say, say something, Dana Carr? Actually, it was Dana Belfiore with DVCC. Oh, oh Dana, <laughs> hi, sorry. And again, I, sorry, my, my, my video isn't working still. Um, so I just wanted to announce that uh, the DVCC has two surveys right now that are out. Um, one is for medical uh, providers. Uh, it's a quick five question survey, it will only take about a minute. Um, and the other is for individuals who may um, come in contact or serve older Delawareans. Um, and that's a little bit of a longer survey, but uh, if you could complete the survey, encourage your staff or any businesses really, um, mostly for the um, persons, older persons in Delaware, um, that survey is for our elderly and domestic violence committee. Um, and we're just trying to get a, a, an idea of where our efforts should be targeted um, within the state. Uh, you know, are there missing pieces? Does, is there a need for increased collaboration? Um, and again, the focus is on persons who are about 50 or older and providers don't need to necessarily have a background in um, or even um, an idea of domestic violence in older Delawareans. We're just trying to get an idea of, of you know, our baseline for our, our providers. So I can see if we can send that out. Um, maybe Sharon, I don't know if you're able to, to send it to committee me members or to the members on this call. Yes. Um, if I you, can... yes, thank you for the reminder of that. You want to send the links to the surveys or um, how, however best for people to access them. We can certainly circulate that. Sure. Okay? Thank you. And thank you. This is wonderful. That, that's great. Um, anyone else with an announcement before we, I, I do want to just once again, Bill, would you be able to post the, um, the link to the, to the SEOW survey in the chat box? I think it's on the list of links that we provided. Um, but before we go, we did want, yeah, Bill just popped it in there. If you have a few minutes, it really shouldn't take you long, but we're just asking you about what it is that, what are the products that you think are most useful? What are the resources you think are most useful and what areas of data you have the greatest need for? So if you could take that, we would be most grateful for um, your feedback on that. Um, does anyone mm -hmm. else wish to provide uh, an update before we go? Can you hear me? This is I Karen can. McLaughlin. Hi, Karen. Um, hi. This isn't strictly data, but it's... it's um, it's applicable in that um, we're trying to make some decisions for Delaware around data. So if anyone is interested in participating in the um, state leadership team for Delta and RPE, we're looking at violence prevention across the, um, across the state and not just prevention, but violence in general and, and those markers. So that meeting is coming up in um, in August, and the host is the Delaware Coalition Against Domestic Violence. It's August 20th. Mm -hmm. And then this fall, we're going to be focusing on the RPE is, is specifically focused on the um, economic supports for women and girls and how that affects violence in general. And so um, we're having an economic summit. And again, that'll be hosted by the Delaware Coalition Against Domestic Violence. I don't have the specific dates for that, but if you watch for it or if you're interested in it, you can reach out to Courtney Winkler or Nikki Kress or anyone from DCADV or, um, 
also go out to their webpage. They'll be posting more information and sharing that in the near future. So, but the leadership team, again, it's a statewide leadership team. It's a collaborative effort. And we really want to get people who are interested in preventing violence and, and um, improving health across Delaware involved in this team. So you may not be a traditional you know, sort of violence prevention or advocate or, or service provider, but you are working with um, different uh, populations and you know, we all know that violence affects everyone. So we need to look at how the risk and protective factors do cross cut against different um, areas and how they're interrelated. And so we invite you to participate in this leadership team and come to one of our meetings and just sort of hear what's going on, okay? Absolutely, um, and, and as, we've, as we have highlighted in the past, we've moved more into that space of shared risk and shared protective factors. And we've created a few Venn diagrams that shows those overlaps and it's pretty significant. So there's tremendous interest in bringing the various different streams of prevention together to, to talk collectively because we know when we go to upstream strategies, they benefit more than one issue, you know? So I think that's a really great recommendation. And Karen, um, if you would send me a little, just two or three sentence blurb that you would like, I can see that that goes out when we send out the materials um, to the attendants um, of the meeting today so that they've got that information Absolutely. on how to reach out, okay? Sure. Absolutely. Super. Anyone else with any announcements before, before we wrap today? Okay. Well, I've, I am very excited. We had a really great visit with you all today. Um, I am sorry that we couldn't do this in person for many reasons, but I think we, I think we were able to make a lot of connection and share a lot of knowledge regardless. And I would like to just say, I hope that when we meet again back in uh, the late fall or early winter, we are able to do that in person. Who knows where we're going with all of this, but for today, and I'm going to hope you'll pardon my pun, but uh, I, I promise not to do too many Hamilton references, but I'm really glad that all of you were able to be in the Zoom where it happened today. So thank you so much. <laughs> We look forward to seeing you all again in about six months. But in the meanwhile, please reach out to us with your thoughts and ideas, with your data needs, uh, with any way that you would like to collaborate with us. We are always open for um, lots of terrific ideas on how to strengthen the, the data infrastructure so that it supports these prevention efforts. Thank you so much on behalf of the team here and have a great rest of the day and rest of the week. Stay safe. Okay. Mm -hmm.